In Yorkshire, detectives have received a 999 call. A member of the public has discovered a suitcase in a country lane on the outskirts of York. He saw the suitcase partly in the hedgerow and partly in the dike. He tried to move it but couldn't because of the weight. He noticed a very pungent smell which made him suspicious. We sent patrol officers to the scene. One of those officers managed to lift the suitcase to the road verge. He did open it because it was unlocked and unfortunately he spotted a human eye and a leg. So he resecured it and escalated it as a murder inquiry. Ian Lynch was the senior investigating officer on duty. We had a suitcase, which was one crime scene, but we hadn't a clue how far that extended for the purposes of a murder inquiry. We were concerned about the leaking body fluids. We didn't want that to contaminate the case, so it was protected by an all-weather inflatable tent. Police set up a cordon 100 metres around the deceased, and the CSIs are called in. Sarah Thurkel has investigated more than 500 deaths in her career and is one of the UK's leading forensic instructors. An outdoor scene is quite a difficult scene to process quite quickly. We'd have to cordon off quite a large area for a retrieval of forensic evidence. When a body is discovered in these unusual circumstances, you're naturally curious as to what may have occurred. And it can be an advantage to hypothesize in your own mind as to what could have occurred. Maybe it's an organized crime group or a drug gang, or maybe it's a hitman who's dumped someone miles from where they are from in a remote location. One scenario could be that the victim was killed by an accident and then the offender's panicked and somehow needs to dispose of the body. But then you have to look at the opposite scenario and think this may be a, like a premeditated murder by a cold and calculated killer. A crime of this nature is certainly difficult to comprehend. It's difficult not to get emotionally involved, but it's important to stay separate from the body and what's happened to that person. From a specialist and moral point of view, I have a job to do to find the forensic evidence that will catch the killer. It's really important to examine the outside of the suitcase before it's even moved. So any contamination or loss of evidence is minimized. These would have been photographed in situ the outside of the suitcase will be fibre taped and swabbed for any DNA. The zips are examined, any handles would have been swabbed to try and ascertain who would sealed that suitcase up. Further analysis of the blue flecks on the outside of the suitcase identified that these were actually paint fragments. There was no obvious link to any blue paint at the scene, but any small bits of evidence like this is recovered at the time because you never know when you first examine a crime scene what might be important in the future. The samples are fast-tracked to the lab for testing. Officers must now transport the suitcase with the body inside to the morgue so the pathologist can try and identify the victim and establish a cause of death. Scenes of crime sterilised uh, one of their vehicles we kept the suitcase stowed, which by that time was in packaging. It was trolleyed to the back of the vehicle and it was driven very, very carefully to York Mortuary. Crime scene investigators can now begin their extensive forensic harvest. It's really important to consider the external environment, where the suitcase has been dumped, what else is in the lay-by, might be footprints in the mud. I would be checking the roadway, any tire track marks, we wanted a fingertip search of the whole road. We also had officers search fields both sides of the road in case anything, a murder weapon or something connected with the victim, had been discarded. A local resident comes forward, claiming to have seen something untoward in the early hours of the morning. This particular motorist left his home at ten past four in the morning. He saw a dark-coloured motor car parked and also a person he took to be the driver standing in the lane. That sighting, which was 16 days before the suitcase was uncovered at this location, was a, a better fit for the decomposition of the body. So that, yes, there was a possibility that this suitcase had been dumped at that time. This sighting indicates that the body has been decomposing for more than two weeks making the pathologist's task of identifying the victim 
more difficult. I attended the post-mortem. The body was badly decomposed. The head was swollen with decomposition. It was very, very difficult. The Home Office pathologist and the scientists took it in turn. Very slow, methodical examination of the body. The pathologist revealed the victim to be female and was just dressed in a bra and no other clothing and her hands were bound with tape and her head, the way her head was bound with tape was quite distinctive. She had a, what was like a balaclava made out of this tape around her head. It not only bound her nose, it bound her mouth as well. Dr Christopher Milroy confirmed it was asphyxiation that caused her death. She was asphyxiated by the tape, which ultimately proved to be the weapon that murdered her. Use of the tape on the face, the head, indicates that this offender was psychologically and physically able to cross a line that many of us simply wouldn't be able to cross to kill this victim and to do so in a deliberately pain-provoking and shame-provoking way. There'd be a number of samples that would be taken from the deceased which would include blood samples, stomach contents, nail scrapings, fingernail cuttings. We would also consider sexual swabs in case the victim had been sexually assaulted. When we checked dental records, DNA and fingerprints against those that had been reported as missing, we got nowhere. We found no evidence of drugs in the body fluids and we found no sexual interference of the body. Scientists turned their attention to the distinctive tape. Strong adhesive tape can provide really good forensic evidence. For example, skin, fibres, hairs from an individual if it's been wrapped around someone's head. But also, you may well get some fingerprints, both on the sticky side, but also on the smooth side. You might also get DNA from where the tape has been ripped by someone's hands or where they've ripped it using their teeth. Struggling to identify the victim, the team are hoping the killer may have left a trace on the tape. Meanwhile, the criminologists begin to build a profile. Some offenders would go to the extreme of burying or burning a body to limit their chances of detection. But in this case, it appears that although an effort was made to arrange the body in the suitcase, take it to the remote roadside, it still leaves them open to being detected. Use of the tape on the face indicates that it was gratuitous. It could be that the offender was creating a sense of enjoyment with messing with the authorities by using this distinctive tape, leaving some sort of clue. Experts could come to the conclusion that this offender was hungry to commit more offences in the same way. DNA profiles and dental records have been unable to identify the female body discovered in a suitcase. We agreed a strategy for examining her head because she was bound in adhesive tape. She was asphyxiated by the tape, which ultimately proved to be the weapon that murdered her. Ian and his team turned their attention to the origin of the distinctive tape, which bears a design by artists Gilbert and George. There was only 851 rolls sold through Tate Galleries, two in London, one in Liverpool, and one in St. Austell in Cornwall. Ian instructs a team of digital specialists to forensically analyse every transaction linked to the 851 sales of the tape. Financial footprint is very helpful for investigators because it has a variety of information that they can use. When you're using your credit card, we can see who is purchasing what. If we're using it in a shop, that means that we have the location, we have the timestamp of that transaction, so a large amount of data that can be used in an investigation. Officers begin to trace the purchases using bank data to eliminate them from the inquiry, but there are many roles unaccounted for. We ask for anyone who had purchased a roll of this tape to please contact the incident room or any police officer. That line of inquiry led to over 630 purchases being traced, but sadly none of them could point us in the direction of who our victim was. Having exhausted all leads, a forensic anthropologist is called in to help. 
It's obviously important for the police and for this investigation to be completed and for somebody to be caught. But I think for many forensic anthropologists and for other forensic specialists, it's a lot about the reconciliation for the family and allowing this person to have a burial to allow for that closure. So it's really important that we identify them so that they have that dignity even in death. A forensic anthropologist is somebody who specializes in human remains. We create something called a biological profile. And the biological profile looks at sex, age, ancestry, and stature or height. There's usually two different kinds of ways that we estimate ancestry. One is an approach which uses measurements. They'll actually measure different variables. The computer programs will use algorithms based on the data that's been put into them before from lots and lots of previous cases to help narrow it down. And then there's also an approach which is based on what we call morphological features. So it's just things that you can see with your eye of usually the skull. Different individuals from across the globe have different facial features that might identify them as part of a specific group. For example, the shape of the nose does seem to vary quite a bit across different countries. Many people from East Asia, specifically Korea, China, and Japan, have a slight fold on the eye, and it's very specific to those populations, and you may not have those in, let's say, people from Northern Europe. In this case, despite the trauma inflicted by the binding, they were able to analyze the eyes and other facial features, which pointed them towards somebody of South Korean or potentially Chinese descent. Meanwhile, detectives turned their attention to the suitcase that the victim was discovered in. We found that the suitcase had been manufactured in Seoul in South Korea, which also pointed to Southeast Asia. The forensic anthropologists analyze the bones and x-rays in order to determine an accurate age of the victim. When somebody is in between, let's say, 15 and 25, our bones are still developing and growing. The sternum is also known as your breastbone. In the center of your chest, it covers your heart. There's actually a whole bunch of teeny tiny pieces. And as you grow, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, they'll all fuse together into one big bone. But even once they're all done, there's still tiny pieces around it that haven't fused, so haven't attached, haven't completed the bone. And that usually happens in late adolescence. So you're looking at maybe anywhere between 15 to 25. Most people are completely done growing by the time they're 25. So these types of little pieces of bone can be really useful in precisely identifying how old somebody might be. In this case, the anthropologists were able to analyze this and determine an age of approximately 20 years for this particular individual. Once that person was identified as being, let's say, possibly Asian, coupled with the sex, the age, and the stature, it would have been able to help really create a good identification of this person. We should be able to narrow down our possible missing persons, and then maybe there's DNA available, and then we could actually match that with the individual. We then appealed for anybody who may have information about anybody who may be missing in the UK from Southeast Asia. We were contacted that night by a South Korean police officer studying criminal justice at Leeds University. He contacted the incident room about the existence of a website in South Korea which contains details of any missing students. Having interrogated that website, the police officer found an entry from the brother of Miss Jane. He put an entry on that website identifying they were concerned about the whereabouts of his sister. She was attending Lyon University where she was doing a French course. She did plan to visit London in the latter part of October, so at that stage of the timeline fitted exactly to our victim. But the brother thought that his sister was back in France. We sent a team of detectives to Seoul in South Korea to liaise with the family and also establish her timeline as they knew it. Simultaneously, we sent a team of detectives from North Yorkshire to Lyon in France. The officers spoke with students and friends of Miss Jean. They confirmed that the victim was planning a trip to London, but had not seen her since. 
we were alerted to the fact that every adult are fingerprinting held on a data patient in South Korea. We got those fingerprints very, very quickly. So on the 2nd of January, several weeks after the body was discovered, that our victim was indeed Miss Jin. Miss Jin had come to England to travel, to experience the world, and she ended up being tortured and attacked in a, a really horrific way by an individual and ultimately murdered by them. This is someone's daughter, a granddaughter or sister, the whole life ahead of them and their life have been tragically cut short in a barbaric way. You can't help but feel empathy for their loved ones. With this new information, Ian suspects that the murder may have occurred in London before Miss Jin's body was deposited 200 miles north in Yorkshire. It was at that stage I made contact with Commander Andre Baker. There was a discussion between North Yorkshire Police and the Metropolitan Police as to who had primacy and it was retained by North Yorkshire Police and they moved into accommodation offices in Tottenham Police Station. At that stage, it was simply to establish a satellite room in London because that was now going to be the centre of our inquiries. And they made contact with the South Korean community in London to confirm if they had any knowledge of Miss Jane and her whereabouts. Miss Jin travelling from France, had made arrangements to visit London and stay for a very short while, having had the permission from her mother to do so. She wanted to feel safe, so she arranged through social media to rent a room from a fellow South Korean national in the centre of London, and she arrived around the 22nd, 23rd of October. Whilst establishing a timeline of Miss Jin's movements, police are alerted to another disappearance. Once we establish links into the South Korean community, supported by Metropolitan Police officers, we then learnt that there was a second South Korean student, Miss Song, had been reported missing in London. Miss Song had also visited London as a tourist. Miss Song had been a student at Guildford. She had completed her studies and wanted to enjoy sightseeing in London. She did exactly the same search on Korean websites looking for accommodation hosted by South Korean nationals in London. The glare of London media really was ramped up when Miss Song was reported missing, but it was nowhere near the media eye that was watching over in South Korea. Whilst we couldn't manage the media over in South Korea, we ensured through our media people that they were informed. And in both these cases, of both families, keeping them informed at every section of the investigation. The police are in the spotlight. The fact that they're two foreign students, the world's media is watching what the police are doing. There's a lot of scrutiny and a lot of pressure to do the best job possible. There was too much coincidence that two South Korean students were missing, had a connection to London and through the inquiries into where those two students were living, they established they both rented properties from the same landlord, a South Korean businessman called Kim. Police need to track down Mr. Kim, as he may hold vital information. Our inquiries into Mr. Kim revealed that he was divorced and moved to the United Kingdom Mr. Kim and his wife went their separate ways. Divorce in Korean culture is not viewed to be socially acceptable, and it may be that this caused embarrassment or uh, difficulty for Mr. Kim. He moved to the UK and began to study English, but his main occupation was as a landlord. He was here as an overstay, he was an illegal immigrant. He stayed in London. He then decided to go into the letting business where he was illegally letting property to other Korean nationals and he had two primary accommodations, one in Eagle Street in Holborn and one in Augusta Street in Poplar. The Macpont police officers who were investigating couldn't make contact. Has he gone to ground? Is he not available? We even thought Mr Kim could potentially be a third victim. Fearing for both Mr Kim and Miss Song's welfare, 
the police gather a team to search both of Mr Kim's properties, starting with Eagle Street in central London. But there is no one home. There's Lockhart's principle. Lockhart's principle is every contact leaves a trace. So the CSI go in and look for minutiae of forensic opportunities. But what they also do is, is they put themselves in the same position of anyone who might commit an offence or be a victim of an offence at that scene. I was potentially looking for an attack site, so I would immediately be thinking of the use of luminol or fluorescent light sources to be able to determine if there has been a clean-up of a crime scene. It was noted by the police officers attending that there had been a recent redecoration of a room which would potentially indicate that something's happened there and someone trying to hide forensic evidence within that scene. The CSIs take samples of the fresh blue paint and use a spectroscope to compare them against the blue flecks sampled from the suitcase. A spectroscope uses a laser light source to break up the light reflected from the paint fragments into its component colours. The same way a prism splits white light into a rainbow. By producing these spectrum waveforms, the scientists can compare them accurately against one another. The blue paint that was found on the walls was consistent with the same blue paint that was found at the crime scene on the outside of the suitcase. As they move through the room, there are signs of sinister activity. When the desk was moved, there was noticeable blood on the skirting board and up the wall. A CSI would be allocated to swab the blood spatters in order to be able to DNA profile them. The blood sample is a match to Miss Jin. The forensic findings indicate she was killed in this room and then placed in the suitcase. But they still need to determine by who. Police in London are searching for Korean landlord Mr. Kim. His apartment has been forensically linked to the murder of Miss Jin, who was discovered dumped in a suitcase in Yorkshire, her head bound by distinctive duct tape. Mr. Kim and fellow Korean national Miss Song are both missing. Police interview Miss Jin's fellow lodgers at the Eagle Street address. South Koreans that were in that property were able to say when they last saw her. Mr. Kim told the lodgers and Miss Jin's family that he had taken her to the train station so she could return to France. But no one had heard from her since. So we know that this young lady was alive around the 26th of October. The suitcase in which Miss Jim was found had been there from about the 2nd of November. Plotting the day the witness claimed to have seen a mysterious figure at the suitcase deposition site and the last confirmed sighting of Miss Jin, police have a five-day window unaccounted for. And so the officer put himself in a position of where would you hold a suitcase? And he found a spot within a room. There's a strong smell of decomposition in the cupboard. Decomposition has a really familiar smell. A number of samples taken from the stain on the carpet and any other area that looked like there may well have been some decomposition. They subsequently recovered blood, body fluids and other forensic samples which matched to our victim, Miss Jane. Once we have evidence of the murder scene, Kim clearly became a murder suspect who's no longer a person of interest. As with Eagle Street, the decision was made to search Augusta Street forensically. It was a property that Mr. Kim had rented and let Miss Song stay at. The CSI had gone in with the murder investigation team, seeing if there was presence of any blood or any disturbance as well. That search was conducted and nothing was found. Nothing yielded from that apartment. We subsequently got intelligence that Mr. Kim had a, an ex-girlfriend living in that area. When the officers entered the ex-girlfriend's property, they saw a roll of Gilbert and George tape on a shelf. It was the same Gilbert and George tape that had been bought from Tate London 
also significant was inside the roll of tape was blood. This then becomes a very vital piece of evidence. DNA was found on the roll of tape and this profile matched the DNA profile that was found in the cupboard. The police teams had a scene-to-scene -scene match, but they had no name to put against that. We also recovered car hire documents. One related to a Peugeot hired from Camden. It was a dark grey colour. This new intelligence leads detectives to the car hire centre, eight miles away in North London, where they locate the vehicle. They search the car for clues and analyse the mileage records. The mileage on that vehicle was consistent with that vehicle having been driven up to North Yorkshire to dump the body. The car hire staff at Camden themselves reported to the police officers that it had a pungent smell in the boot. They tried unsuccessfully to clean it, but the smell remained. The car is immediately seized and a team of CSIs begin to harvest it for any evidence. There tends to be potentially good forensic evidence within the boot area, mainly because of the fabric that the boot area is made up of. The carpet would hold on to the trace evidence, particularly blood stains. It's quite thick, it will get into the weave of the carpet. During the forensic examination of this hire car, they were able to identify not only blood within the vehicle, but also they were able to identify marks in the boot as to where the case had been placed. DNA from the decomposition has seeped out from the suitcase and has been found in the carpet in the boot of the vehicle. We subsequently confirmed that was a vehicle used to dump Miss Jane in Oscombe Richard. The pressure to locate Mr Kim and Miss Song intensifies. There were 66 detectives and police staff working on this case. Analysts, mobile phone investigators, CCTV operatives, people that track cars, people that were finding money anywhere. Mr Kim's financial records reveal he's more than £20,000 in debt. To identify a possible motive, detectives gain access to Miss Jin's and Miss Song's bank accounts. Miss Jin's credit cards and bank cards were used. One was a Leon bank and one was a Korean bank. The Korean bank account had all funds taken out by the bank card in London. The police then request access to the Leon-based French account. They identify a withdrawal made at an ATM in Paris on the 1st of November, five days after the police believe Miss Jin was murdered. Mr. Kim had been saying to Miss Jin's family whenever they made contact with him, but he had told the family that Miss Jin had returned to France. And to assist that trail, he had got another young South Korean female to go to Paris and withdraw money from Miss Jin's Lyon bank. He told that woman that it was actually his girlfriend's bank account, he just wanted the money out. Actually depicted it of all finances. Relationships with others and money appear to be key factors when considering the majority of murder cases. This crime is not just of a violent nature, it also seems to be of an inquisitive nature in that he was in financial trouble, that there was an element of desperation, both of a violent nature and to acquire the money that he needed. This suggests that this crime was premeditated with the main intention to get hold of the money. One line of inquiry was Miss Song's bank card, which led to a timeline inquiry on the use of that card. She was reported missing on the 10th of December in London, which was well before we discovered Miss Jin's identification, well before we had forensic recovered from the properties belonging to Mr. Kim. Prior to being reported missing, a bank card had been used to extract cash from a cash machine and within a very short distance of that cash machine was a travel agent's where a ticket for Mr Kim had been purchased for air travel to Canada, presumably using the cash withdrawn from Miss Song's cash card. 
So there was a possibility Miss Song was already dead at that stage. Our efforts to try and find Mr. Kim were now centered on Canada and the need to liaise with Canadian police. Meanwhile, we had a number of South Korean sources that were in touch with him or his associates that kept us updated of what his intentions were. 17th of January, we identified through a number of arenas, including people that were close to him, that he was back in London, and in fact, he was in a internet cafe in Oxford Street. Mr. Kim's log onto the internet provides Andy's team a location. They must act fast, as this could be their only chance. We dispatch police officers straight to that cafe, and he was arrested. The detectives finally have their man. We had a number of hours to interview him about the murder of Miss Jin and the disappearance of Miss Song. His explanation around the murder of Miss Jin is she went off to France. That, in his head, covered the story of the friend that he got to take money out from her bank account in Paris. What he told friends, what he told her family, lied all the way through. Regarding Miss Song, he said, well, I went off to Canada. Don't know what she did, but I think she went back home. We believe that Kim was going to maintain his charade. Meanwhile, all this evidence was mounting on him. Forensics have found evidence of her being bludgeoned in the bedroom in Eagle Street, the suitcase being left in the cupboard. Please take a DNA sample from Mr. Kim to compare to the unidentified samples found at Eagle Street. DNA taken from Mr. Kim. Match samples taken from the carpet in the cupboard. The detectives have forensically linked Mr. Kim to the site where they believe Miss Jin was murdered. They then compare his sample to that of the distinctive tape. And it is a positive match. Forensics have found Kim's DNA on the tape that were bound Miss Jin. Really strong evidence now. This compelling forensic evidence is sufficient to charge Mr. Kim for the murder of Miss Jin. He is remanded in custody and sticks to his story that Miss Song returned to France. Inquiries continue, him now charged with the murder of Miss Jin, and we've still got a murder investigation of Miss Song, but we haven't found Miss Song or Miss Song's body. As the search for Miss Song intensifies, Please receive a phone call from the maintenance worker from Mr. Kim's Augusta Street property, which the police had recently searched. On the 15th of March, a plumber working in the same block as the flat, which was occupied by Mr. Kim, was being attended to. He noticed a large quantity of blue bottles emanating through the plumbing system at that block. Lots of flies and blue bottles tends to indicate that maybe there's a very decomposed body. Because he had known about the possibility of a murder and certainly Miss Song missing, he called the police straight away. Police immediately attended, identified where the blue bottles were in the bathroom. They were in the floor above in the masonette. Mr. Kim's apartment is sealed off and is subject to another search. Immediately below, to the left of the front door, there was a brick wall. It had this very thin wooden panel that had screws in and then mastic to seal it up completely. And when the officers took off the mastic and then took the screws away, they saw a very small cupboard space. There was a lot of clothing in there and a duvet, and they saw a foot protruding from the duvet. At that stage, we declared it critical incident because we had searched that flat in Augusta Street, hadn't found anything and then weeks on the blue bottles appeared in the bathroom above this cupboard space. The plumber had seen them, contacted the police and we found our body. Korean landlord Mr Kim has been charged with the murder of Miss Jin. 
Whilst he's on remand in Belmarsh Prison, detectives have discovered the body of Miss Song in a secret compartment in one of his rental properties. Gold Commander Andy Baker is leading the investigation. She was there for over three months. She would have been decomposing over that period of time, the smell when you opened up that panel. It was a big police presence because we had to secure the area. Miss Song was bound in a very similar fashion as Miss Jim. She had this across her face, which had been asphyxiated, and also across her head. All you could see was her eyes on forehead. This scene is almost like a scene from a horror movie. Her head was bound so tightly that her eyes were protruding from her skull. Would have upset a number of people working on it, especially when young innocent victims being attacked and bound in a really horrific way. We're all human and we have emotions. I've got a daughter, I've got a son. I really feel for their families and the fact that they've lost their loved one. This poor girl had been murdered and the pathologist that examined both of that tape and body said he's only ever seen this once before. So very rare. It shows that the same person had done that taping. There were marked similarities in the tape that was used and in the way that the bodies were bound, which might indicate the offender's modus operandi or particular style of offending that they use. It's possible that offenders want to repeat and replicate the experience that they've had previously when they've carried out an offence and replicate that euphoria. Mr Kim is claiming he was out of the country when Miss Song disappeared. It is vital that the police establish a time of death for Miss Song to refute his claims. The premises were immediately sealed, painstakingly decided to hold everything. We had to keep Miss Song in situ so that we can do all the tests for the entomologist. Entomologists, these are experts who look at flies and insects. Heat measures are taken of the area where Miss Song had been deposited wrapped up and the flat generally because from previous knowledge of other murder investigations that forensic expert in entomology would look at the blue bottles uh, the pooper uh, the lava and the eggs they're the four cycles of a blue bottle and you can actually work the cycle of a generation of a generation of a generation in that heat and you determine when the first generation of blue bottle had settled that decision to wait get the ambient temperatures and to work out the cycle of blue bottle from egg to two stages to fly allowed the entomologist to time the death as close as possible to a date in December. Using the flies we could establish that she had been murdered in Mr Kim's flat before he left the country to go to Canada. After a period of over 24 hours, the officers were able to recover Miss Song's body. Now the body has been removed from the flat, the CSIs can do a full forensic harvest. A mastic gun was found at the scene, and this could prove to be a crucial bit of evidence. You'd assume that this mastic gun was the same one that was used to seal the compartment where Miss Song's were stored. The outside surface of that mastic gun is really good for fingerprints. The fingerprints that were found on the mastic gun were a positive match to Mr. Kim. There's yet another element of forensic evidence linking Kim directly to the murder of Miss Song. Police now have enough evidence to charge Mr. Kim for the murder of Miss Song. Kim maintained this silence of knowledge of the murders right up until his trial. And the families were assisted in travelling to the UK for the trial. He appeared at court, both charges were put to him, pleas were taken, and he offered to plead guilty to manslaughter of Miss Song, the second victim, which is interesting because that's the one where he said, I was in Canada, don't know where she was, but the forensic evidence had mounted against him. The Crown decided, no, we're going for a full trial on both matters. On the 23rd of March 2003, Kim was eventually convicted of the two murders of Miss Jin and Miss Song. The judge said, 
that Kim had snuffed out the lives of two young women. Kim had taken control and murdered two innocent women for greed. He was desperate for cash. He was living outside of his means. He took full advantage of both Green students. He stripped their bank accounts and he also stripped the bank accounts of their families. Mr. Kim lost his mother when he was two years old. A lack of secure attachment with a maternal figure can lead to reduced empathy and difficulties in forming relationships with others. Mr. Kim may have internalized his financial worries and issues instead of reaching out to others. Difficulties in emotional self-regulation and expression can put an enormous burden on somebody and can lead to poor and impulsive decision-making. And in this extreme, the desperation for money appears to have gripped the offender to go to such great lengths to commit two murders. Kim had stolen no more than three, four thousand pounds in total. He received the mandatory sentence for murder of life imprisonment. He showed absolutely no remorse. He still hadn't disclosed what happened. He wasn't bothered in the slightest. If you were to ask me about what I thought of Kim, yeah, he's a cold-blooded murderer. Apart from how he killed these two poor young women and deposited them or left them or secreted them, he continued to let those apartments, knowing one had been murdered and then taken out in a suitcase, and one had been murdered and left in the flat. So he was very calculating. Why did he put one of the victims and deposit her up in North Yorkshire? We don't know. But it might have been a sense of get her away from this place as far as possible. Why did he leave Miss Song in the cupboard in Augusta Street? It could be that he couldn't move her. So he put her in there, sealed her in there to come back another day and remove her. Or he thought she was so sealed in, she wouldn't be found. The case was proved by extensive forensic evidence and what has got to be one of the most involved joint police investigations ever undertaken. The judge also commented that it was a Rolls-Royce investigation, which was a compliment to everyone involved in the investigation. I recall going to a memorial service held in New Malden, which is where the concentration of South Koreans community were domiciled in London quite a high number of the team went and I went along to represent Metropolitan Police Service and the community of London. And family and friends were there. Really moving experience. It's really sad to think that these two young women of 21, 22, one had decided with the permission and sanction of agreement of her mother to visit London from France before she returned back to South Korea and the other one who had moved into London having finished her course in Guildford, think they'd be safe, even more so, with someone from their own country, their own community, that they met their death in this way.